Welcome to part two of the airfoil selection process for the UWS-1 ultralight airplane from the ultralight airplane workshop. My name is Leon. Since part two of the video got a little bit long, I've cut it up and now there's going to be a part three of the airfoil selection process. Fortunately, this video is not going to be all slides like a lot of the previous videos were. We're going to have a little fun with the XFLR5 software program and analyzing some airfoils. Let's have a quick review of the selection criteria that we will use in selecting our airfoil. And we went over this in part one, but real quick, let's do it again. We have to decide between a laminar and a turbulent boundary layer on our airfoil. A laminar should give us less drag, but a turbulent should give us a higher angle of attack at stall and should give us a higher coefficient of lift. So we're gonna to have to come up with a decision on whether we wanna go with laminar versus turbulent. We also wanna take a close look at our coefficient of lift at stall and what our angle of attack at stall is. And this really has to do with the angle of the airplane as we're landing. And instead of being a selection criteria, we just wanna pay attention to this to make sure it just is, isn't outlandish, like a 25 degree angle of attack or even a Five degree angle of attack. Neither one of those would be very useful. Coefficient of lift of stall, of course, gives us uh, the surface area for our airplane, and we've already gone over what that is in a previous video. We also want to look at the coefficient of lift at cruise and the coefficient of drag at cruise. More importantly, though, we'll look at the coefficient of drag and we'll just kind of pay attention to the coefficient of lift. Another thing we're going to do is look at the coefficient of moment. There are some things we want to be careful of so that we can maintain a positive pitch stability on the airplane. And we also want to take a look at spar thickness. We want to be able to have a fairly thick spar, but we want, don't want to have it so thick that it causes a, a significant drag on the airplane. Now we come to our first decision on our new airfoil for the UWS-1 Ultralight. At least for the first version of UWS-1, I'm going to choose a turbulent airfoil. And that basically comes down to one of the disadvantages of the laminar boundary layer airfoils. If you trip the laminar layer from laminar to turbulent, it ends up usually having more drag than if you had a turbulent airfoil, all other things being equal. I plan to fly this airplane mostly in the evening hours, like the hour before sunset. And that happens to be, at least in my part of the country, when all the bugs come out. And so you'll frequently, especially if you're doing touch and go practices, you're gonna build up a lot of bugs on the leading edge of the airfoil. That will disrupt a laminar airflow and turn it turbulent and cause a lot more drag than you would for a turbulent airfoil. By choosing a turbulent airfoil, we've knocked out a whole bunch of possible airfoils for the airplane, and we'll only look at turbulent airfoils. Now we do give up a little bit of drag over a clean laminar airfoil, but I think overall it'll be worth it. One of the things I haven't mentioned before is how can you tell the difference between a turbulent and a laminar airfoil? Well, one of course is to just look at the data for the airfoil, does it have a drag bucket at the low angles of attack? I will use the XFLR5 software program to try to give you an idea of what a drag bucket is. What we are looking at here is a plot of coefficient of drag versus coefficient of lift for an airfoil. In this case, the airfoil is the Harry Riblet GA35U-415 airfoil. This is a laminar flow airfoil, but it only has laminar flow back around 35% of the cord. Another thing to mention about this graph is that this line is increasing angle of attack as you travel in this direction. So this area up here is generally the maximum lift coefficient at stall, so it's gonna be right around this area. This area down in here is where kind of the area where you'll be cruising. It's going to be somewhere around zero degrees angle of attack down to this area. What I'd like for you to look at is how the coefficient of drag has this little bump in this curve that comes down. So lower coefficient of drag for this area. And then there's a transition 
out here in this area and there's a transition down here. These transitions are where the boundary layer of the airfoil is transitioning from laminar, which in this area, to turbulent out in this area. So as you're increasing angle of attack, you start getting a laminar to turbulent boundary layer transition. So that's increasing the drag. Same thing this way, as you start getting uh, a negative angle of attack or close to zero angle of attack, on the bottom side of the airfoil, you're going to start getting a turbulent boundary layer transition. So this area in here is called the drag bucket, where you've got laminar flow here and a transition to turbulent. So if you're looking at a coefficient of lift versus drag plot like this, and you see this little drag bucket out here, that lets you know that you've got a laminar airfoil. Now let's compare that to a airfoil that's designed to be turbulent airflow for the whole cord of the airfoil. Okay, this red line is a turbulent airfoil. It's a 30U415, which is also a hairy riblet airfoil. In this case, there is no drag bucket along here. This is turbulent for the whole distance. And it's kind of interesting notice, outside of this drag bucket area, turbulent airfoil has a lower coefficient of drag than laminar does. So that's it's something important to keep in mind. When a laminar trips to turbulent, it's actually going to have usually a greater drag than a similar airfoil that's designed to be turbulent. How can you tell by just visually inspecting the airfoil, the profile of the airfoil? Using the XFLR5 program, we can look at the profile of a couple of these airfoils. In fact, they're the same airfoils we just got done looking at for the drag bucket description. So again, the red airfoil is a turbulent airfoil. It's the GA30U415. The blue airfoil is a laminar boundary layer airfoil, the GA35U415. So you can see the laminar airfoil has a smaller nose radius than the turbulent airfoil. It has a larger nose radius. So that's one of the key features you can look at on the profile of an airfoil to try to figure out if it's laminar. Also, generally, this area here in the front 10% or so of the airfoil will also generally be a little bit flatter than on a turbulent airfoil. Another thing that you will generally see, and it's really not easy to see by looking at the profile, but if you can look at some of the data on the airfoil, the position of the maximum thickness will frequently be farther back on the laminar airfoil than on the turbulent airfoil. On turbulent airfoils, then you'll see the maximum thickness at usually not more than 30%. It could go up to 35%. On the laminar airfoils, you'll see the maximum thickness at usually not less than 35% and frequently at 40, 45, even 50% of the cord. So just by looking at the profile, we can probably guess on whether it's going to be a turbulent or a laminar boundary airfoil. Now it's time to talk about the coefficient of lift of our wing at stall. I've decided to use flaps on the wing in order to reach a coefficient lift maximum of at least 2.0 when we're in stall. What did I use to come up with that? If you'll remember back to our wing size video for the UWS-1 design, the analytical method for determining wing size, I came up with a surface area of 108 square feet, which gave us a lift coefficient of 2.0. But we're gonna be looking at the section characteristics of airfoils. Almost always your coefficient of lift for the wing is going to be lower than the coefficient of lift for the airfoil sections. That's pretty difficult to come up with computationally unless you have some really great software. But we can use an estimation that the lift efficiency of a wing is about 85%. Now for a rectangular wing it's going to be closer to 75%. But for our wing we're somewhere between a tapered wing and an elliptical wing. So we should be able to get pretty close to this 85%. So if we use a lift coefficient of the wing of 2.0 and an efficiency of 0.85, that means the section lift coefficient needs to be 2.35. So we need to find an airfoil that can lift at 2.35. Well, that's not realistic. It's almost impossible to get an airfoil with that much lift 
that doesn't have so much drag you can't even pull it through the air. To reach this 2.35 lift coefficient for the section, we're going to have to put some sort of high lift devices on the wing. Now this could be slats on the leading edge, but I'm going to stick with flaps on the trailing edge. Since we've got to use some sort of trailing edge flaps to get our section lift coefficient higher, what kind of flap should we use? I did a significant amount of looking through Horner's book on fluid dynamic lift to figure out what kind of flaps I wanted to use. I finally just settled on slotted flaps. This should give us a section coefficient lift of roughly 2.5. It could be as high as 2.6. That's for a simple hinged slotted flap. If we have an extended lip flap with optimum movement of the nose of the flap, we could get up to 2.8. But for this ultralight, I don't think we'll go with that because it's a little complex to create that movement and a little bit heavier than if we just use a simple hinge. The section lift coefficient of 2.5 is large enough compared to the 2.35 that we just derived in the previous slide that we'd actually now have an opportunity to reduce the planform surface area of our wing if we use full span flaps. That'll give us a chance to possibly reduce the weight of the wing and the weight of the airplane. But at least for now, I'm going to stick with the 108 square feet, and we'll do some testing and see how that works out. But for now, I'm going to stick with the 108 square feet, at least until we get a little farther into the design. Now, since we're going to use these slotted flaps, the maximum coefficient of the section airfoil without flaps, in other words, flaps in neutral position, is not really that important. Since the majority of that coefficient of lift up to 2.5 is provided by the slotted flap and not necessarily by the shape of the airfoil. We can now concentrate on optimizing our airfoil then for the cruise condition to try to get that coefficient of drag down and the coefficient of moment down. Now again, referring back to the wing size design of part one of the UWS-1 design, we found out that with that 108 square foot surface area for the wing, we're going to have to have a coefficient of cruise at about 0.38. So then what we need to do is think about the coefficient of lift of a various airfoils at cruise speed. At that coefficient of lift of 0.38, we want to try to minimize drag. So selecting an airfoil that has a low drag at that particular coefficient of lift. Now we don't have a specific coefficient of drag that we're interested in. We're just going to try to pick out the minimum from the airfoils that we have to choose from. Our next to last selection criteria for our, our airfoil is the coefficient of moment. We don't have a specific coefficient of moment that we're going to go for. What we will try to do is do a trade-off with what we had on the previous slide, the coefficient of lift, coefficient of drag at cruise, try to have a good value for drag, but also have a good value for the coefficient of moment. And that would be a low value, or value that's close to zero as we can get. So at coefficient of moment, we have to have less than zero. That means it's trying to pitch down or pitch forward. If we had a coefficient of moment that was greater than zero, that means it's gonna to try to pitch up. And we do not want that when we're getting close to stall. That means it'll just make our stall worse. But also, we don't want a large coefficient of moment, in other words, a large negative coefficient of moment when we're at cruise. So we're going to try to keep the cruise coefficient of moment from being too large and have the stall coefficient of moment be as close to zero as you can. So we're going to have a trade-off when we're looking at our airfoils. We're going to be looking at our coefficient of moment and coefficient of drag at cruise. And now for our last selection criteria for our airfoil, the thickness. I'm going to test, take a guess on this one and try a 15% thick airfoil. I know that the Ultra Cruiser has an 18% thick airfoil, but I think I can probably get by with a thinner one so I can get a little bit less drag, but still have it be light enough. The thicker the airfoil is, lighter the spar caps will be, the thinner it is, the heavier I'm going to have to make the spark caps in order to handle the bending load of the wing. We have the opposite desirable issue, where the thinner it is, the less drag we'll have. 
So uh, I'm thinking 15% will probably work. We'll probably explore around that. Maybe take a look at calculations for the weight and drag for both a 13% thick and a 17% thick airfoils. If the 17% thick airfoil is almost no difference in drag over 15%, I might go up to 70%, 16, 18, somewhere around in there. But I'll do a little comparisons to see what I learn. Let's use the XFLR5 software program to compare a few airfoils that have been used on ultralights. See what we can learn. I've now brought up the XFLR5 program with several airfoils that have been used on ultralights or at least variations of those airfoils. The first one here is the Clark Y airfoil. Now the one I found had a 12% thickness. I want to compare the same thickness on all these airfoils. So I've used the XFLR5 capability of, of changing the thickness. And just in case you're curious, the way you can do that is select your airfoil, right click, and you probably can't see the text on this, but there's a menu option called scale camber and thickness. Click on that, it pops up a little dialog where you can change the camber value, the maximum exposition of the camber, the thickness value, and that maximum thickness exposition. So all I did then was come down to the thickness value and pull it up to 15%, and then I saved it. And that would be this airfoil here. So this is the Clark Y airfoil with the thickness changed to 15%. Another thing I wanted to try to keep constant between these airfoils to help compare them is the camber percent. I want it to be around 3.4, or at least fairly close to that. Another airfoil that I brought in that has been used on the Hummel Ultra Cruiser, although a slightly thinner version of it, is the GA30U-615 from Harry Riblet. Now, on the Ultra Cruiser, it used the 18% thick airfoil. And as I just said previously on the slide for our thickness decision, right now I'm going with the 15%. So again, I used the XFLR5 program to change the thickness down to 15%. Also for comparison, I pulled out of a Harry Riblet's book, the General Aviation Airplane Airfoil, the 30U415. This is very similar to the 615, but with a little bit less camber. So what I did with the 615 is I went into the program and changed it to a camber of 3.4. And the 30U415 already had a camber of 3.6. That's close enough that I just left it alone. And then for good measure, I threw in the NACA 3415 airfoil. Although I massaged it a little bit and gave it the camber of 3.4%. And it's kind of interesting that all these airfoils have the exposition of that camber fairly close together from around 40% to 43%. And the exposition of the maximum thickness is fairly close to 30%. Just kind of thought it was interesting that they all turned out to be pretty close to that. Let's look at the differences on these airfoil profiles. Let's start up here at the nose. Let's zoom in on that. And we can see it's a couple of interesting differences right here. This red line is the Clark Y airfoil, and you can see it's dropped lower near the nose than the other airfoils. That's effectively giving it a little bit of a drooped nose, which should increase the lift of the airfoil. The other airfoils are fairly close together right here at the nose. Now back here, around the 20% cord area, there is a little bit more of a difference. This yellow airfoil, which is the General Aviation 30U415, is a little bit higher. The camber is a little bit higher up here in the 20% area, 15% area than the other airfoils. And then let's come back to the trailing edge where you can see a little bit of difference also. There's not a whole lot of difference on the bottom edge, a little bit, but you see more difference here on the top edge, where the green airfoil line, which is the Harry Riblet 30U615, which is the ultralight airfoil, it almost has a little bit of cusp here on this top edge. It's certainly lower than the other airfoils, whereas this white line, 
which is the NAC airfoil, is a little bit higher. So that's kind of the profile differences of these airfoils. Now let's go run an analysis on these and compare the coefficient of lift versus coefficient of drag plots. Well, here's the coefficient of lift versus coefficient of drag plot. Now this was calculated using a Reynolds number of 1.7 million, which should be fairly close to our 55 knot cruise speed. And as you can see, these plots are pretty close to each other. It's not a significant variation. There's a little bit of variation up here near the stall, but not a whole lot. So let's zoom in a little bit more to our cruise coefficient lift, which is 0.38 currently. And again, you can see there's not a whole lot of difference between these. Although what is kind of interesting is we have more drag down here at 0.38 than we have up here at about 0.55. So you would think that at least on this red airfoil, which is the Clark Y, that would be a better location to operate that airfoil. Let's zoom in here a little bit closer down here and see what we can learn in more detail. Now when we get down here, the Clark Y is still operating pretty good, barely edging it out at 0.38 is this green airfoil, which is the modified 30U615, so it's been modified down to a closer to a 415. But really there's not a whole lot of difference between these. So it's a little bit disturbing though, that in fact all these airfoils work better have a lower coefficient of drag up in this area. So it would be nice to figure out how to maybe modify these airfoils to get them operate with a lower coefficient of drag down here closer to our coefficient of lift that we're going to have during cruise. Well, before we move off and start thinking more about that, let's look at our coefficient of lift plot. So here's coefficient of lift versus angle of attack. They're all fairly similar down in here, although this does tell you that the green aerofoil, which is the modified 615, will operate at close to zero angle of attack, where the Clark Y would probably come closer to, oh, one and a half degrees, negative one and a half degrees in order to operate at the coefficient lift that we want. They all come out to having a pretty close to the same maximum coefficient of lift. The Clark Y does stall at a slightly lower angle of attack than the other three airfoils, but it's not significant enough to really be a deciding factor. Now, one thing it does do though, is it does fall off faster after you've reached stall. So that's not quite as desirable as these other three, which have a much smoother fall off of the coefficient lift after you've reached stall let's take a look at the coefficient of moment. So here's our coefficient of moment versus angle of attack. Now this is kind of interesting. This is telling us then that the Clark Y airfoil has a greater coefficient of moment than the other three. Now that would then make the Clark Y less desirable. See, it's got a greater coefficient of moment near stall and a greater coefficient of moment in cruise and, and at climb except for this area here. Now as far as the best performing one for coefficient of moment would be the green one, which is the modified 30U615, modified to have the same camber as the other three airfoils. So it's actually behaving better in coefficient of moment. All other things being equal then, this would be a better performing airfoil. So back to the coefficient lift versus coefficient drag. This modified 30U615 also has a fairly good coefficient of drag. Overall, if I were just to pick an airfoil based on what we're looking at now, I would pick this modified 30U615. But I wonder if we can make it better. Well, we've got an airfoil that could work, but could be better. So in part three, we'll use the XFLR5 software to see if we can get this airfoil to perform a little bit better by playing around with the amount of camber, the maximum camber position, and the maximum thickness position. And then we'll also play around a little bit with the thickness of the airfoil.